So our study guide this week is for the brain and the spine, and I want to break this unit down into many lectures, as the brain and the spine has so much detail, um, some of which you'll be familiar with. Um, you have probably gone over the spine and the brain several times in other anatomy classes, but seeing it in cross-section will make it a little more challenging. Um, but also easier in some ways as you're able to start picturing things in three dimensions. So uh, we're going to start with the ventricles because that contains a CSF space. And when you look at MRI and you look for the fluid, um, on a T2 weighted MRI you're going to notice that the fluid is bright white. And on a T1 you'll notice it's dark. Um, proton density is more of a gray. And so when you start to recognize those um, ventricular spaces and the CSF spaces, you'll know what kind of an image you're looking at almost immediately. And from there, once you know where the CSF spaces are, you can place your anatomy around it. So we'll start with the CSF spaces and take a look at those, and then um, we'll cover the meninges as well as the meninges covers the entire brain and the spine as well. Um, I brought up this image here from eAnatomy, and this is part of their um, diagram section for the brain. And I want you to be sure that when you're looking at eAnatomy that you not only look at the images, but also the diagrams, because the diagrams can be very helpful. I especially like this one because um, it shows uh, the lateral ventricles, and you can see that there's one on each hemisphere of the brain. Um, and uh, it shows it in two different colors here, so it almost looks like a shadow, but it's one ventricle in each hemisphere of the brain. And that uh, is a little bit nicer than some of the other ones that I have seen, so I wanted to show you that as well. Um, so we'll go over the ventricle spaces, and I want you to also look at your Weir book, W-E-I-R, Weir book, the um, one that was required for this class and in it you will find a number of T2 weighted images. Um, so I have focused more on the T1 weighting in this lecture, but I've also put some T2 weighted images in as well. But more of the brain images in the Weir book are T2, and there are a few T1 images, uh, I believe, focusing on the pituitary. So take a look at those images in there because they are very nice um, detailed images as well. So uh, the last thing I want to mention is that when you're taking a look at T1 versus T2 weighting of the brain, while the T2 weighting may be easier to find the CSF spaces, and it's really nice to look at the T2 weighting for that, the T1 weighting sometimes makes it easier to look at the gray-white matter differentiation. So be sure you look at both, um, especially when you're looking for um, like the gray matter of the basal ganglia when we get to that point. Um, so be sure to look at all your references and all the images that you can find. Uh, I know I, I lied. There's one more thing I want to mention. MRI Master also has some good images for um, the brain and the spine, all, basically all anatomy and also some pathology as well. So once again, that's MRI Master. Com. Here is your list of required items to know for uh, the upcoming exams for the ventricles and CSF, meninges, spinal cord, vertebrae, ligaments, and disc. So those are the items that you should be familiar with. And the ventricles. Let's take a look at these. So the ventricles contain the CSF space, and the CSF is made by the choroid plexus, and the choroid plexus sits in three places. We're going to see that a little bit later, but it sits in the floor of the lateral ventricles, in the roof of the third ventricle, and the floor of the fourth ventricle. But let's get a little bit more familiar with the ventricles first. So we have the lateral ventricles, and they are shaped basically like a C with a little tail sticking out the back. Um, you've got one on either side, so one in each cerebral hemisphere. And if you were to take your hands and made the letter C with each hand and facing one another, and then you turned the opening of the C to face forward and touch your index fingers together and slightly separate your thumbs away from one another, this would be about the shape of the lateral ventricles. Um, so this is how they sit in your brain, with the tips of your fingers being the um, 
frontal or anterior horns of the lateral ventricles and your thumbs being the temporal lobes of the lateral ventricles. And then your arms would be really long occipital lobe um, or posterior horns of the lateral ventricles. So kind of picture that in your head. This is the way they sit. And we'll see that a little bit better in another image um, down the line, but I just want to give you an idea of, of how you're looking at them in three dimension. So here's a lateral lateral ventricles and this is the frontal or anterior horn of the lateral ventricles. This is the central or body part of the lateral ventricle. This area here is called the trigone and I'm going to explain why in just a moment. Um, this is the occipital or posterior horn and then this is the temporal horn of the lateral, ve lateral ventricle. So this is the C shape and they touch together here very close together anyway, not completely, but they are very close to one another um, through the uh, central or body part. Um, but other than that, they do not um, touch one another at all. There's a very thin membrane called the septum pellucidum between the two lateral ventricles here in the middle. Um, and this area here that's between the um, central part, the body part of the lateral ventricle, the occipital horn, and the temporal lobe is called the trigone. So you can remember it's, it's between the three places, tri, meaning three. So that's the trigone area of the lateral ventricles. And then we've got this connection here between each lateral ventricle and the third ventricle, and this is the foramen of Monroe, and this allows a CSF fluid that's made by the choroid plexus here in the lateral ventricles to flow down into the third ventricle as well, even though the third makes some of its own CSF. So then you have the third ventricle here, and it's got a choroid plexus at the top of the ventricle, and the thalamus sits on either side of the third ventricle and so this little area here is called the interthalamic adhesion and it allows um, the pathway in between the two sides of the thalamus to connect. And then you have um, some recesses here on the third ventricle and coming down, oh, and also posteriorly. And then here you have the cerebral aqueduct or aqueduct of Sylvius that allows CSF to flow from the third ventricle to the fourth ventricle. So in some places you'll see it called the cerebral aqueduct and sometimes the aqueduct of Sylvius, either is correct. And then this is the fourth ventricle, it's sort of triangular and it goes back um, into the uh, cerebellum. And then you have these other recesses, the left lateral recess is also called the foramen of Lushka, Lushka, and then the median aperture is called the foramen of Magendi. And you'll notice that the lateral recess um, has two, the foramen of Lushka, there are two of them coming anteriorly and slightly um, laterally, and then the foramen of Magendi, uh, there's only one. And uh, one way to remember this is as you go um, inferiorly, L comes before M, and also um, the lateral apertures are Lushka and the median aperture is Magendi. So that's one other, other way to um, remember that. Here are some images of the choroid plexus. And as I mentioned before, they live in the floor of the lateral ventricles and in the roof of the third ventricle and in the floor of the fourth ventricle. They also live within the trigone area and because these are all midline images it's hard to see that but we're going to look at that a little bit later on when we see a coronal view. You'll see that um, the trigone area actually contains um, the majority of the choroid plexus or the largest grouping of choroid plexus. Um, but this will show you the CSF flow um, from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle down through the aqueduct of Sylvius into the fourth ventricle and then down into the spinal cord. And when you take a look at this image here, this is a really great drawing. These two here both show the spinal canal and how the CSF runs in a very narrow, um, almost like a, a thread down the center of the spinal column. And this can get enlarged if there is a tumor or any trauma. Um, this enlargement of the little thread of CSF that runs down the center of the cord is called a syrinx, S-Y-R-I-N-X, syrinx. Mm -hmm. And um, so you will see then that CSF within the spinal 
canal on the spinal column, but normally you do not see that on uh, an MRI or a CT unless there is some um, enlargement of that spinal canal. But this opening right here in between um, the uh, foramen of Magendi and the um, uh, I'm sorry, in between the uh, where the uh, CSF comes out of the fourth. Um, this is the foramen of Magendi here, but this little opening here at the top of the spinal column um, is called the obex. Right here is called the obex, and we'll see that in a later image. Um, but when you are drawing the CSF flow, if you draw that for the course or if you are setting it for the exams, um, these two are so close, the foramen of Magendi and the obex, that if I have an arrow pointing to this area um, and you label it the foramen of Magendi or the obex, I'm going to count either one as correct because they are very hard to distinguish on any image. Um, so let's take a look at that CSF flow one more time. Um, the CSF is created by the choroid plexus. Um, it is made in the floor of the lateral ventricles, uh, flows down into the third ventricle, is also made in the roof of the third ventricle, flows down through the aqueduct of Sylvius or cerebral aqueduct into the fourth ventricle, which extends in towards the cerebellum, and down through the um, foramen of Lushka and the foramen of Magendi, and out through those apertures to bathe the rest of the spinal canal and um, go up through the arachnoid spaces into the rest of the brain. And this is just another great image of, from eAnatomy that allows you to see the same thing, just a little bit different image. These two views allow you to see uh, what the lateral ventricles look like um, from an anterior view as well as from a lateral view um, and give you just a really good look at the foramen of Lushka and those um, lateral apertures here. Um, so again, just to re reiterate what we've already said, um, the five divisions of the lateral ventricles are the anterior or frontal horn, um, the body or central part of the lateral ventricles, the trigone, the occipital or posterior horn, and the temporal, the temporal sits in the temporal lobe, the temporal or um, an, uh, inferior horn of the lateral ventricles. And that is a set of two. Remember, the lateral ventricles have two, and you can see that here on this image. This is looking at the patient from the anterior side. So you have the frontal horns here and the body. You can't see the trigone or the occipital horns because they point backwards here behind this section. But then you can see the temporal horns or the um, inferior horns as they come around into the temporal lobe. And you can see how you have two of those here. And then you have the third ventricle and the aqueduct of Sylvius or cerebral aqueduct and the fourth ventricle. And this is all singular. So you've got just singular third aqueduct of Sylvius, fourth, and then um, the foramen of Magendi as it comes down here and into the central canal. And then this is the f uh, foramen of Lushka. And you can see how they turn anteriorly and laterally as well, and that there are two of them. That made a lot more sense to me when I could see that anteriorly. Um, so I'm hoping that that image helped you as well. So the frontal anterior horn is within the anterior and frontal lobes of the brain, and they're right and left. They are separated by the septum pellucidum. So in the front here, they've opened it up a little bit so that you can see the third ventricle, but the an anterior and frontal horns of the lateral ventricles are actually much closer, and they are separated by a very thin um, filament called the septum pellucidum, and we will see that a little bit uh, later on. Um, the body is posterior from the frontal horn and just inferior to the corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum runs um, over the top, uh, like right through here, um, of the um, lateral ventricles. So superior to the lateral ventricles and also anterior to the lateral ventricles. And it's going to be hard to see in these images. It will be easier when we're taking a look at them um, in axial planes. The occipital or posterior horn is within the occipital lobe of the brain and is the most posterior section of the lateral ventricles. The temporal or inferior horn is again the most inferior horn set within the temporal lobes of the brain and courses inferior 
and lateral from the trigone. So you can see it comes inferior and then lateral from the trigone. And also it moves anterior as well. So inferior, lateral, and anterior. And the trigone area is this triangular area here between the body, the occipital horn, and the temporal horn. When you look at the lateral ventricles in a coronal section, it's much easier to see um, how the lateral ventricles are uh, two separate um, ventricles and the third and fourth are singular. Um, so here we're looking at a coronal section at about the area of the thalamus. So you can see the thalamus here on either side of the third ventricle. These are the lateral ventricles here and you can see the choroid plexus that's shown here in pink. This is the right ventricle and this is the left ventricle. And you can see the choroid plexus within the um, lateral ventricles. And then here is the septum pellucidum, very small thin filament here in between the two um, lateral ventricles. And then the corpus callosum runs along the uh, superior border of the lateral ventricles. And then from there you have the foramen of Monroe, one on each side, the right and the left, and they come down into the third ventricle. You can see the choroid plexus on the roof of the third ventricle. And then this is the interthalamic adhesion here. And uh, then uh, we're not quite seeing the fourth and the uh, uh, foramen of Lushka and Magendi just because of the angle of this particular slice that Netters has drawn. But you do see the inferior or temporal horn of the lateral ventricle and the choroid plexus within it and this is actually the trigone area of the, um, it's actually maybe a little bit more anterior than the trigone, but the largest portion of choroid plexus sits in the trigone area of the lateral ventricles. So when you start to imagine the lateral ventricles in three dimensions, you're able to see how they are more, um, they're closer together anteriorly. And then as they go posteriorly, they start to separate from one another and move laterally and inferior. So that we start with them up here, um, closer together in the uh, superior part of the brain. And then as we slice inferiorly with an axial image, the uh, lateral ventricles, the temporal horn and the occipital horn will be much more lateral. And we'll see that in these axial images coming up.